Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Very excited to be joined by Ryan Craig, who's the co-founder and managing director of University Ventures. He's written a few uh, really interesting books, College Disrupted and A New You. He's a senior contributor at Forbes, where you can read his pieces. They're really beautifully written. We're going to get into all that, but before we do, let's dispense with the amenities. Ryan, welcome to Trending in Education. Michael, pleasure to be here. Good to see you. Yeah, it's good to have you. And you're someone who's had his eye towards the future of education for a good number of years now. Even when you wrote College Disrupted, it was a bit of a game changer in terms of some of the the trends towards unbundling and last mile learning between that and A New You, your second book, you coined a lot of phrases or really popularized a lot of notions about where education was going. Good job by you. But that sets higher expectations for us now when we're trying to understand where the future is coming. So any initial perspective on where things are headed? There's a lot going on. It's hard to keep track of, but uh, but I have enjoyed uh, in particular some of your recent articles which we'll be sharing out to our audience. But any top of your mind thoughts uh, as we kick this off? I suppose we're only as good as our latest prediction. As investors, we're only as good as our latest investment. That's fair. Well, look, as we begin the long recovery from COVID, I think we've seen a couple of further changes to the situation I've been painting for a number of years. Uh, The entry-level jobs are even harder to come by for new and recent college graduates and, and young people who are looking to launch their careers We have remote hiring, remote onboarding, remote work, which just simply sets a very high bar for employers. And so I think the class of 2020 has graduated into probably the worst entry-level job market we've seen, Mm. even in the Great Recession, based on what we've seen with some of our portfolio companies. uh, It's just awful. And the trends that uh, I've been talking about, the importance of getting a good first job for young people or or any uh, individual who's matriculating into a post-secondary education program, mm-hmm. uh, multiply that by some factor at this point. It's, yeah. it's just absolutely the key uh, reason why uh, someone would enroll in an institution or a, an education provider just simply isn't equipped to answer the question of what kind of job am I going to get as a result of this uh, this investment and this experience and this credential. I don't know how much longer they're going to be around, yeah. uh, frankly, with the exception of obviously the top brands uh, sure. in, in post-secondary uh, education. Mm-hmm. The second thing I would say is that the combination of the shift to remote learning and the complete refusal of virtually every college and university in the country uh, to discount uh, tuition uh, for what was just a fraction of the experience Mm -hmm. uh, that uh, students were paying for is simply just going to accelerate the trend towards unbundling. Yeah. The bundle, again, just as a refresher, in my first book, I referenced the degree as a bundle in the same way that we used to buy music, Mm -hmm. you know, CDs or the same way that Old folks like us used to buy cable TV yeah, exactly. packages. Yeah. Now we yeah. you know, stream what we want. We pay for what we want when we when we want it. What's happened over the last year is that folks have been paying for the bundle, but getting probably the least uh, important yeah. part of that bundle, which is online courses, mm-hmm. uh, but nothing else. And it, I think that's just going to heighten the level of skepticism. The, the gap between uh, the price that's being paid and the value being received uh, by students is now higher than it's ever been. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's just going to further reinforce that uh, focus on return on investment yeah. and the, on the first job. And it's really a double whammy for colleges and universities. Value gap is bigger than ever. And the entry-level employment market is worse than it's ever been. Right. It's no surprise to me that, for example, community college enrollment, new enrollment fell 21% mm-hmm. uh, last fall. Not that community colleges are the most expensive part uh, of the ecosystem, far from it. But just gives you a sense of what people are thinking about traditional post-secondary uh, institutions. Right. And if they could perhaps get something smaller than even an associate's degree that was more targeted to employment, that would be a preferable option. And that's the other aspect of the, the work that you've been doing uh, for some time now is also understanding what are some of the other approaches that can help streamline the system. There is the notion of disruption and the innovator's dilemma and all these kinds of things have been talked about for some time, but then was the pandemic a shock to system that pushes us forward in interesting ways around the evolution of the marketplace? Any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, look, all the surveys that we've seen uh, uh, it, it, since the start of the pandemic have indicated that to the extent that uh, respondents are thinking about post-secondary education, they're looking at faster and cheaper uh, alternatives. They're not interested in enrolling in a multi-year degree program right. at this point, but faster and cheaper is absolutely the way to go. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the benefit of these faster and cheaper programs, you say uh, disruptive, which connotes at least initially lower quality. Mm-hmm. We're seeing and we're investing in pathways that are not lower quality. They're actually a clearly superior value proposition from the get-go. Yeah. Instead of paying tuition or taking any financial risk, you're being paid uh, right. from parents. These are truly apprenticeship type mm-hmm. programs. Right, uh, right. In my view, the only thing that is standing between hundreds of traditional colleges and universities and significantly diminished enrollment is the lack of supply mm-hmm. uh, of, these, of these new apprenticeship uh, programs. If you can envision apprenticeships into 20 or 30 different skill gap sectors across technology and healthcare yeah. operating across every major market in the country and rolling thousands of new mm-hmm. apprentices each year, it will fundamentally change the enrollment patterns of millions of, of, of young people. Because why would you take a risk on a, a degree from a, a non-brand name or non-selective institution, mm-hmm. uh, have a paid pathway first job, get your foot on the first rung of a career ladder, with no debt, and then look around and ascertain what secondary or tertiary post-secondary yeah. pathway you need in order to build up those cognitive skills, critical thinking. Mm-hmm. So again, we're, we are not arguing for less post-secondary education and aggregate per capita, but what we are saying is that we're about to see a massive uh, restaging of how that post-secondary education is consumed from all you can eat in one sitting, mm-hmm. you need when you need it. Given the fact that your typical entry-level job now is best characterized as you're using one or more software platforms to manage one or more business functions. The pathways that provide training on those software platforms and, and business functions are going to be the ones that lead most directly and efficiently to those good first jobs. I saw you mentioned Salesforce as an example. Can you tell that story? Sure. Look, there are 300,000 open Salesforce jobs right now unfilled, even you know now in January of COVID. Five million Salesforce jobs are going to be created over the next five years. And I was speaking to an audience of college and university presidents a few years ago, about 400 of them, and asked uh, the question, how many of your institutions provide any training at all on the Salesforce platform? And not one hand went up in the room. My guess is that probably a couple of them did. They may not have known about it, but I think it speaks volumes. There's just no training. Universities continue to think that their job is to prepare students for their fifth job, right. not their first job. But we know now that if you don't get a good first job, underemployed in your first job, two thirds of the time you're gonna be underemployed five years later, half the time you'll be underemployed a decade later, which makes right. sense. your careers are path dependent. Your second, your third employer is gonna care a lot. Mm-hmm. Your first job was maybe more about that than where you went to school or what you studied or even whether you went to college to earn uh, a degree. Yeah, it's interesting. It does make me think about getting back to the disruptive idea is that frequently non-consumers are the, the real market that opens up when you go to this cheaper, more accessible product. And that to me seems much closer to what you see around uh, workforce training and some of the models emerging out of what Google or Amazon, you you wrote about Amazon recently in a Forbes uh, article. It was interesting too, because it was also in Amazon season, which is all year round, but particularly in December. So it was an interesting angle on it. But, But can you talk a little bit about the workforce side of the equation and how employers are stepping up or not stepping up to the plate as far as meeting these skills gap needs? Yeah, sure. I've written a couple of things. The first one I wrote was, I think, back in the summer or early fall, where I talked about how we're seeing all these announcements from Microsoft and Google, where right. their big COVID workforce initiatives are, we're going to offer free online training on our products and technology. Mm-hmm. Of course, the sad fact is that the people who most need that, the people who most need that point of entry into the workforce uh, are the people uh, for whom completion rates in asynchronous online courses are sub 5%. That's not the answer, Mm -hmm. right? Everyone thinks that we've launched a couple of asynchronous online courses. Our job is done here, Google or Microsoft. Right. They're sorely mistaken. That doesn't work. What does work is what Amazon uh, has done with its new initiative, where they're launching training, immersive training in their distribution centers, where they're essentially paying for community colleges and other workforce providers to come in and actually offer in-person classes and not in anything, but in a specific set uh, of uh, subjects and topics where there are open jobs, proven open jobs in that market. 
That makes sense. Uh, that makes a ton of sense. And obviously is a huge benefit for Amazon uh, distribution center employees. And it's going to make it easier for Amazon to uh, attract and retain better talent uh, mm -hmm. in distribution. Yeah. Uh, yes. distribution centers. Yeah. And they've done interesting work also around outskilling. It was something that Amazon in particular was thinking about, which is the other aspect of this, which is the, the need to continue to develop new skills and always be learning really throughout your life course. But I do understand your point about the, the most critical period in establishing the right trajectory to your earning potential and career growth is, is right after college. And that's been the primary focus of the work you're doing with University Ventures. That's right. The new firm is called Achieve Partners in part because the models we're building mm. are university nor ventures. The, the, the new name is Achieve Partners. And what we're doing okay. is we're closing the skills gap by essentially buying companies uh, that have solved the hardest part of the skills gap, the connection to the end employer. Mm -hmm. So we're buying business services companies that operate in skill gap sectors like cybersecurity or data science and analytics. Yeah. Companies that have dozens or hundreds of clients already and for whom their biggest barrier to growth is access to trained talent and who've probably thought about investing in an apprenticeship program or the equivalent of it, yep. thought about building a business around solving that problem for their clients because their clients uh, are hurting for talent as much as they are. And so we're going and we're buying these companies and then we're building last mile training into them mm -hmm. and transforming them into what we call talent as a service companies. And, and so we were getting them into the business of with a new product. That, that, they, that new product is providing purpose-trained talent mm -hmm. to clients on a try before you buy basis. And that we found, we've done this now six or seven times, that ex dramatically accelerates the revenue growth of these businesses and expands their margins. Yeah. Uh, this is a, a purely private sector solution uh, to the question that policymakers have been struggling with for decades, which is how to expand apprenticeships beyond the building and construction trades. Uh, mm -hmm. These policymakers have looked to end employers, the Verizons and American Expresses of the world, and asked, when are you going to launch massive apprenticeship programs? And the answer is they're never going to do it. Who will do it is companies that can build a business around providing purpose-trained talent. Got uh, it. Clients mm -hmm. uh, are looking for those companies that are well-positioned to enter that business. And this first fund, our goal is putting 100,000 Americans into good jobs they would not have been able to attain if not for the creation of these new pathways. Wow. That we're inside these companies. Nice. Good stuff. So yeah. we got so excited in what you've been writing about and, and all this other stuff. We didn't get your, your origin story. So can sure. we hear from you in whatever uh, way makes sense? Just yeah. what got you to this point in your professional life? Sure. So I'm from Canada originally, got into Yale <laughs> from Canada, which was bizarre, but, and I had fortunate enough to have, have a grandparents who were uh, able to help me pay for it. So came down to the, to the U.S., had an incredible college experience at Yale where I majored in literature. And then by junior year, I realized I probably needed to make sure I got a job too. So I also double majored in economics <laughs> and actually wrote my senior essay comparing the American and Canadian university, uh, mm. an econometric analysis of the two systems. Since that was my first real work in higher education, I went from there uh, to work at McKinsey in New York, which is this, the kind of an exam exemplar of kind of the pathways that we're trying to build yep. uh, these uh, sort of new economy industries where they pay you to learn mm -hmm. uh, effectively. But then I went uh, from there back to Yale Law School just because, uh, ma mainly because McKinsey had worn me out after two years. They, <laughs> pound of they, have, they have a reputation uh, for doing that. So I wanted a, I wanted a three-year vacation. So I did that, which Yale Law School is very good at, very good at doing. And then went from there to, I was connected through an initiative from me with a Yale Law alum where he was, uh, this was the dot-com era. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, uh, this fellow by the name of Peter Price he was working for NBC and was trying to uh, put a deal together, essentially, where NBC was going to help launch an online university with Cambridge and Columbia. Mm. And uh, that initiative didn't take off, but it led to the creation of a company uh, within Columbia University called Fathom. Mm. Uh, and they hired me as their first head of business development. Okay. Uh, I spent two years running around uh, the globe, signing up universities for this first online education where we're mm. going to essentially project all of the knowledge and content of these universities mm -hmm. online on a website that uh, really didn't have a business model. <laughs> so, which and was this the, this uh, was uh, early 2000s? That's right. It was yeah, 99 through uh, 2001. Wow. Well as I was there. So I, yeah. it was great. I signed up Cambridge and uh, Lenin School of Economics and University of Michigan, University of Chicago, and lots of museums and libraries. And it, it was cool, but 
as I said, there was no business model <laughs> yeah. to support it. The, yeah. the idea at the time, the best idea we had was uh, we could use all of this branded content to essentially attract people and sell them online courses. But unfortunately at the time, the only credit bearing or degree granting online courses that were available were from University of Phoenix or extension schools, which mm-hmm. really was a mismatch with the, the kind of content. And so I left there and started my investing career. Right. Uh, I joined Warburg Pincus, the uh, private equity firm, where I basically helped create their education and training investment group, a mm-hmm. uh, number of successful investments there, the, the best known of which is a company that became Bridgepoint Education, mm-hmm. uh, which was uh, one of the fast growing online universities. And that company went public five years later, as now called Zovio, which is an ed, ed tech provider. And it was on the, the basis of that, that ultimately I was able to raise the university ventures. Exactly. And, uh, yeah. You know, university ventures, it was originally intended to be uh, a, a fund that this was back in 2010, 2011, the OPMs were just taking off. And so yep. The idea was we were going to back OPMs and similar companies that would help universities and colleges do things that they weren't good at doing or couldn't do. Yeah. Um, and so we had a, a number of different strategies, investment theses, but after a few years, we began to turn our attention to the intersection of education and employment mm-hmm. for the uh, simple reason that we saw the results of the great recession on millennials and recognized that higher education was not only struggling through a crisis of completion in a crisis of affordability, but also a crisis of employability Mm -hmm. uh, and that there had to be better options. And so that's when we began to invest outside of traditional universities, investing in coding boot camps, for example, or income share programs, and eventually making it through to this apprenticeship model and investing in staffing companies and business services companies that we recognized already had the hardest part of the puzzle, uh, which is the connection to the end employer. And that's really, I think, what's important here. It's very difficult for a school or a college or university to develop those real, meaningful, deep, sustained relationships with employers, way where those employers are fully engaged with the curriculum uh, development, invested in the program, willing to hire uh, your graduates. So it it does happen. Uh, It's rare. It's rare that it happens at scale. And and so I I truly believe that that intersection between high school and a good first job, that space... Mm -hmm. This spring is really, I think, the first spring where we're seeing the first Gen Z grads mm-hmm. graduating from college or university and going out into the workforce. Think about what's going to occupy that that space yeah. between high school and a good first job. Call it traditional four-year colleges and universities, they have big problems. Yeah. As we were saying at the top, there's lots of reasons to believe that for this generation, they may not be the best option. Right. Uh, or, and uh, the piece you wrote, because, uh, which I enjoyed the analogizing to uh, Quibi, which had gone too soon, but uh, but the level to which we, including, I'll include myself there, when Quibi flamed out famously, I got glib about it. I enjoyed making some jokes about Quibi gone in a heartbeat, but then when Indiana University in Pennsylvania goes under the whole tone and tenor of the conversation shifts, can you expand on that a little bit? Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's a, I wasn't planning to write that until I read that uh, New York Times piece. And I said, what's there's something missing here, which is you're actually not doing a very good job of framing what this institution is doing for its students. You're taking a you know myopic view of one student's relationship with a faculty member. Right. You made the point that I'm sure you could find a relationship at Quibi that was equally uh, deep and heartwarming. You could do a profile, but it's a failing institution for one very good reason, which is that it's failing its students. Mm-hmm. And we shouldn't romanticize these, these colleges and universities. And I think I'm sure the reason it, it, it happens so often is that these schools, they all have the same sort of accoutrement. They all have the same sort of quads and they look the same and they're structured the same and they're accredited by the same folks. And they probably remind you, they remind the journalist of where, you know, he or she went to school. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not, it's not a guarantee that journalists probably went to a selective school and uh, IUP is charging something like $20,000 a year tuition and more when you include room and board mm-hmm. and produce. I think that in the article, I, I said the at age 35 or 38 or something like that, the average uh, salary of graduates is 38,000. So those numbers just don't work. Right. They, 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 they don't work. And, and so we have to recognize that we, we shouldn't wish any institution ill, but we should certainly uh, be able to wish for institutions to change. Why- and you learn from failure too. Why are these institutions failing? And what I appreciate when I get it from you or others is when there's clearer articulation of alternatives. 
because I think frequently they're out there. It's just the information doesn't get sp spread out enough. Maybe they're not designed to scale and it doesn't always reach the audience who needs to hear about it. Are you seeing any positive examples of places where some of these last mile programs, some of these partnerships are working well? You mentioned the apprenticeships earlier, but are there, are there other examples that come to mind? You mean, I'll say, first of all, we are seeing a ton of activity outside of traditional college and university. Maybe I'll come to that in a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, but let me just say that I look, I think traditional institutions are just struggling uh, right now to cope with what's going on yeah. uh, in, in the world. And I don't blame them. Having said that, I think as we begin to uh, revert to some level of normalcy, there are a lot of things uh, that call, traditional colleges and universities can do to address the kinds of things we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no reason why uh, schools should not be seriously considering building upside down degree programs where the first year, instead of doing gen ed, uh, courses, uh, you're doing uh, one or two industry recognized certifications so that mm. the 40 or 50% of students who don't complete that degree are at least exiting the institution with something of value, a credential mm. of value uh, in the market. They should be thinking about digital credentialing and disaggregating that degree program and in the in individual courses into specific skills and recognizing those skills with portable credentials like Credly provides, for example, so, they, so students can export them to LinkedIn and to Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, to employers. They should be integrating work integrated learning. So not everybody can build a Northeastern like co-op program that takes decades and tens of millions of dollars. Yeah. Uh, but there are increasingly online marketplaces uh, like Ripen that are matching real projects from uh, real employers with faculty and courses. Hmm. So students in a given course can have a capstone experience, which is a real work project for a real employer. Cool. Uh, yeah. Which is highly valuable. Uh, they should be thinking about restructuring career services from one individual office on a corner of the campus to something which is integrated into everything the institution does. Mm -hmm. In every academic head, department, uh, chair, dean, and faculty member should have take responsibility for career services and the employment outcomes yeah. of the students uh, they're serving. And by having career services as a separate office, it basically absolves uh, all those people of responsibility mm -hmm. uh, for the most important outcome. Yeah. Of uh, for, for these institutions. Yeah. There's a lot they can be doing. I don't expect the elite institutions to do any of that, but I do expect the U Indiana University of Pennsylvania's right. uh, world to be doing most of those things. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to continue to attract students. Yeah. And then you had some examples maybe outside of higher ed that also uh, jumped to mind? Yeah, absolutely. The work that we're doing where we're trying to build these apprenticeship uh, programs uh, across all these skill gap sectors. Right now, I think we probably have seven or eight uh, different uh, pathways that are operating in maybe 15 or 20 markets across the country, mm -hmm. more of them. And we need to go faster. We recognize, yeah. we recognize that, but the, the demand is there. And, and the key is that our programs are providing a guaranteed job and a guaranteed pathway, which means that we level the playing field for candidates. It's not a question who can afford uh, to pay for a boot camp or who can afford to pay for a master's degree or even a bachelor's uh, right. program. Mm -hmm. This is a paid apprenticeship, so you're earning while you're learning, and we are screening on cognitive skills, we're screening on sort of technical uh, potential, and we're screening on diversity as well. Mm -hmm. the, our employer, our company's employer clients value diversity. It, it's truly that kind of socio-economic uh, mobility engine that higher education used to be. Mm -hmm. When higher education was priced at $1,000 a semester, there's very little finance, very little risk uh, right. for Candidates. It truly was an engine of socioeconomic mobility. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd say even a free college program, which President Biden is you know, hoping to put in place, at least at public colleges and universities, I, I don't think that's going to have the same uh, impact because of the cost of living. They have to pay for cost of living. They're still going to take out, still going to have need to have grants or loans right. to pay, pay for that. Much better to have a paid uh, pathway where you can truly support yourself mm -hmm. uh, while you're learning. Yep. Uh, and then a guaranteed job at the end of the road. Mm -hmm. uh, and to have that, it's truly accessible to the most disadvantaged uh, populations in the country. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And we, we will want to get your views into the future before we wrap up. But prior to that, I did want to pick up also on community colleges and the role that community colleges can play. There was an interesting way in which you incorporated the Dr. Jill Biden kerfuffle, where I think I'm very much pro Dr. Jill, and it sounded from your piece that you are as well, but I think you have used that as uh, a device to get us into a deeper conversation about what community colleges 
can and should be doing and where there might be some misalignment there. So I, I'd love to hear a few beats from you on that. Look, I think the question that wasn't asked with all of that controversy in December is why did Jill Biden need to uh, become a doctor in order to teach at a community college? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer to that is community colleges are academic institutions run uh, primarily by folks who would probably rather be uh, running four-year uh, universities. They all attended those four-year uh, universities. I can't think of a single community college president who was a graduate of a community college, mm. but that's their, their terminal degree. They all have master's and doctoral degrees. And in fact, to teach at a community college, you need a master's or doctoral degree unless you're teaching a non-credit uh, course. And it turns out to become full-time faculty because there's so much competition for those roles, you pretty much need a doctorate. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the pathway that uh, Dr. Biden followed. She was teaching as an adjunct for a number of years until she finally, she earned her uh, doctorate in 2007. The, the EDD, which arguably is a little more applied, just in case Dr. Jill wants to appear, I, I just want to be clear that I'm pro <laughs> yeah. Dr. Jill, but yeah, please continue. Yeah, yeah it's great. No, I, 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 as am I, as yeah. am I. Yeah. And, but I'm not, but she, she, she's a victim of the system as well. The system yeah. privileging and basically in a lazy way, I would say using traditional academic uh, credentials to determine uh, who the best faculty members uh, should be mm -hmm. in community colleges. And the kinds of things that you learn in a doctoral program, even an ETD, right. writing, uh, research, and so forth, are really not the key skills mm -hmm. the college faculty need. Right. You know, it, much better to have folks who come from these industries and sectors where students are trying to get jobs, who have networks uh, in these sectors, who have the kind of empathy that Dr. Jill does. So she checks that box uh, for sure. Yeah. But it, it's basically a mismatch in terms of you, you don't need traditional academics teaching community college courses, but much better off to have practitioners. But the problem is community colleges don't have a good shorthand to determine which of those practitioners are qualified. In fact, their accreditors require that they have master's degrees. So there you have it. So that that means that these institutions are going to be academic yeah. uh, so -perpetuating. rather than what, what I call you know placement colleges. Really, colleges should become placement colleges where the goal is to take a candidate, evaluate where they are, uh, where they can get to with some bespoke program, which doesn't need to be a two-year associate's degree, but could be a three-month program, could be a one-year program, and then set them on their path and actually help them get their, that, that job. Right. They should be. And it's, it should be a combination of an academic institution that, that they are today and, and a workforce board. Right. Uh, effectively. But right now we have uh, dysfunctional community colleges and dysfunctional workforce boards uh, neither is doing a, a good job for very different reasons. Yeah. Although it, I do hear some notes of optimism around community colleges' ability to adapt, partly because of the dire circumstances that many of them are under, that they're going to need to pivot. If they haven't pivoted towards social mobility, the community colleges are under so much pressure to respond to their constituents that in many ways they are moving into these partnerships and the equivalent of what used to be a vocational track. Isn't some of that activity still happening? Oh, sure. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, the, the non-credit certificate poor part of community colleges, that's the valuable part. What's, what's not nearly as valuable is the academic transfer part where they're mm -hmm. offering associate's degrees right. uh, in a variety of topics, hoping to get students to transfer uh, to four-year institutions. And that, that what I said, called subservient transfer role is just simply absolving universities of the need to build cheaper uh, bachelor's degree programs. Right, uh, right. And accessible bachelor's degree programs. Mm -hmm. uh, traditional four-year colleges and universities should be responsible for developing those pathways, and they should do it themselves so that you don't need to deal with the transfer. They should be responsible for doing that. Can, then community colleges can focus on one thing, which is job training, job placement, and uh, they wouldn't be academic institutions, mm -hmm. uh, the result. Yeah, it's interesting. Heady stuff, some tra transformative thinking, but I think folks are more open to it these days in light of the, the, the turbulence that we've all navigated or not navigated over the past uh, past year plus. I would say the turbulence over the last five years. If you think of true. all of the economic, social, and even political turmoil we've seen in the country, I attribute much of it to the sense of loss of or lack of economic opportunity. Mm -hmm. Uh, which is if you could imagine a world where we had dozens of these paid pathways, apprenticeships in every market across the country serving thousands uh, of students at each one, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have folks on either side of the spectrum rioting uh, right. in the streets. The opportunity is there. Yeah. It is there. And the crazy part is we have 7 million unfilled jobs right. uh, in, the, in, in the country. I think it's the case that 
if you're seeking to be upskilled in an area where there is a skills gap and someone's asking you to pay tuition or take any financial risk at all for that, they have an unimaginative business model uh, mm-hmm. because there's a willing payor for that upskilling. And that's the ultimate employer. Mm-hmm. We need to escape from the bounds uh, of traditional Title IV uh, tuition-based post-secondary uh, education and rethink that uh, the models that are possible uh, mm-hmm. there. That's what we're trying to do. Yeah, it's really uh, interesting stuff. And, and keep an eye out and, for what Ryan is writing to keep a, an ear out for when he's on podcasts like this. And before before we let you go, Ryan, I, I always love to ask my guests, what else out there in the this great, uh, big, beautiful world of ours is capturing your imagination these days? Anything else new emerging? Anything for us to be uh, noticing or paying attention to? The platform is yours. Take us wherever you want to go. Great. Well, there's so much. We're, we're focused, obviously, on these new apprenticeship models, uh, focusing on work-integrated learning, digital credentialing. For example, I'm writing a piece now on what will it take for new digital credentials, novel credentials to essentially uh, upend uh, traditional degree uh, mm-hmm. uh, credentials. I think it's possible. It, 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 it will happen. Uh, so watch, watch for that. Mm-hmm. But look, like uh, most, I think, are just yearning for a return to normalcy. My kids have been out of school for yeah. months now. They haven't been had a day of, of school yeah. since last last March. I'll settle for the good old the good old battle days at this point, and so we can regroup and then plan the, the future together. But I, I firmly disagree with those who say the future is online. There's no question that once you have your foot on the first rung of a career ladder, your upskilling needs will be dealt with online. Mm-hmm. You've obviously demonstrated that you're capable uh, of some post-secondary education, landing that first job, performing in that good first first job. Online will take care of you. But the gap between high school and a good first job mm. uh, is going to need continue to need to be done. Unless technology uh, somehow advances by leaps and bounds in the coming years and we figure out a way to actually train on the soft skills and emotional skills and personal skills that employers value via over a distance or remotely. Mm-hmm. That is going to need to be done in person in a physical space. And the question is, what, what physical space? Right. Uh, before your colleges and universities? For some, yes, but for many, that's not going to be the best answer. Community colleges have their limitations, as we've discussed. Yeah. High schools are going to play a bigger role. I see m- many more requests now from innovative charter schools and school districts who are thinking about K-14, mm. and K-12, because they're seeing the, yeah. the negative outcomes, the negative career outcomes uh, on their graduates. Um, right. We're just not satisfied. So why can't we leverage the physical plant of the 25,000 plus high schools out there? The Bidens are focused on the 1,000 community colleges out there. There are 25,000 high schools that are mostly open evenings and weekends. And if you're talking about an unbundled way, you can do that at a high school. Yeah. You can do that at a high school. So look for more programs hmm. like that. And then I think the models that we're, that we're pushing out, these paid apprenticeship models are going to be very important. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, fantastic stuff. Hopefully those out there, you, we whetted your appetite and uh, you got a little uh, taste of what you might read or get exposed to if you track Ryan Craig. He's a co-founder and managing director of Achieve Partners. Uh, he wrote A New You and College Disrupted. Track him uh, on Twitter, track him on Forbes, track him wherever he is out there in the world. Ryan, thanks so much for joining. Michael, it was fun. Thanks a lot. Our- All right. And for our listeners, we'll be back again soon. Thanks for listening. This is Trending in Education.